morning. For a great day, we've got a nice turnout, smiling faces, good to see you all. I've, I want to give a special thanks to those who were able to show up yesterday uh, for the Shred event. Uh, we raised 155 bucks in cash and checks and scored a couple hundred pounds of food. So it was a smaller event than we've had. I mean, the harvest was small, but the laborers were many. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. And so um, it was. What was really nice is everyone was staying busy, even though there wasn't a whole lot of traffic through here. I was killing fire ant mounds, and other people were trimming bushes and uh, working in the kitchen. And it just uh, it was. And I know you guys are all waiting for when we get the, when we can first have our first covered dish dinner. We'll have to wait a little bit longer. You know that. But aside from worship, I think this is probably the first time we had come together as a congregation in 16 months. Maybe we have, but I don't recall it. But it felt very, very good. And a special thanks to Linda who set that up. We may not be able to fellowship like we would like, but we can still do works of service and in the name of Jesus Christ. So we did that yesterday, and I was happy, happy, happy to see it. If you missed out, you missed out on a lot of sweat. If it was a warm day. But we had everyone there, everyone comfortable, and good day. Good edge. Looks more like what the future looks like. All right. If you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, Mount Hermon Lutheran Church is having a guest lecture tonight from 4 to 5.30 about dementia through the lens of grace. So that's, no, that's, that's next Sunday is when that is, not this Sunday. Next Sunday. Might be an interesting topic. So we're still in, everyone's nicely masked, we're still doing that, and I will mask up at the time of communion, otherwise I'm going to stay a nice distance back here and work there from you guys. So, any other announcements to be made for the good, uh, oh yeah, after church today, we're going to have a brief one topic meeting, that is want air conditioners for the fellowship hall or not? And I'm not trying to sway your vote in any direction, vote as your conscience, but just remember that we do live in South Carolina and it is August. <laughs> we had a big panic this week because we had some troubles with the kitchen air conditioner, but those are sorted out. It's nice and cool. Our ice machine is installed. Um, it's meant to be used if you need some ice. All right. Any other announcements there to be made? You guys? No, nothing? Okay. Let's stand and prepare ourselves for worship with confession and forgiveness found on page three of your worship folder.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. your people with life that is eternal. Direct our choices and preserve us in your truth that renouncing what is false and evil we may live in you. Through your son Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. All right, you may be seated. First reading is from Joshua, the 24th chapter. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to see them and summoned the elders, the, the heads, the judge, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose island, whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, For be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. 
He protected us along all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the people of the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. The, Lord, the word of the Lord. God. We're going to read the psalm responsibly. The eyes of the Lord are are upon the righteous, and, the God, and God's ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to erase the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears them, and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and save those whose spirits are crushed. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from everyone. God will keep safe all their bones. Not, Not one, one of them, them shall, be, shall broken. be broken. Evil will bring death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. Lord, you redeem the life of your servants, and those who put their trust in you will not be punished. The second reading is from Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, against the spiritual force of evil in the heavenly places, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put your breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, which with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always preserve supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an, an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard this, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what 
if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before. It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is the useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that, were, that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you, that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have come to, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. We know this phrase. It's part of our liturgy. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I almost just automatically said, Alleluia, Alleluia. Because it's part of the gospel acclamation. That is to say, when, you know, why do we stand when we read the gospel? Because when you're in the presence of the words of Jesus being spoken as we have this morning, it's our belief that you are in the presence of Christ himself. This, this is how God, this is how Jesus makes himself present. Through sacrament, yes, in the waters of baptism, in the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ himself in Holy Communion, but also in Christ's very words. And so we're inspired to stand and give our attention to the words of Jesus. Now, as Paul writes to the Ephesians, he knows this. He knows that the words he's speaking, he believes that he is, as it says in our Ephesians passage this morning, I am an ambassador in chains. Now, he means he's bound to Christ. He's in service to Christ. He's a servant, but he's also an ambassador. And an ambassador in those days, how would an ambassador do his job? He would go into the presence of whoever he was serving, listen to them speak, then go to where he was supposed to speak and say, thus says the king, and repeat verbatim those very things that he, was, that he had heard the king speak. And then it's his job to listen very carefully to the response of perhaps another king or whatever, and go back to his king and relay those words exactly. And so that's Paul doing what he believes to do. And he gives a strong warning to the Ephesians. And it's the same warning that Jesus gives in the gospel lesson. It's going to be hard. And it's not going to be hard just merely physically. It might be, but those would be things of the flesh. It's going to be hard spiritually, which is a different matter. And he sets up the entire, this entire passage. It's, it's called, you've heard this passage before. It's called the armor of God passage. And he sets the entire thing up in a big, giant, because, therefore type statement. We know the armor of God. Why, why, why do I need armor? He says, look, as a Christian, our struggle are not against enemies of blood and flesh. That's not what's going to, you know, there's, I was talking with the guy who was operating the shred truck here yesterday, and he was telling me, um, 
he was just, you know, he was saying that they've had a lot less business and they don't do these things for churches as much as often. And I said, you know, it's, it's a tough time in the church. It's a tough time. And I don't think we're going to bounce out of this COVID situation exactly like we went into it. Some of the things we can do, we can still worship, we can still do service, we will still be able to eat together. But this is going to be a hard thing, particularly in America. You know, America's a, a funny place because either you think, you know, if you're, a, a, if you're not a Christian, you think, those Americans, they're just nuts about Jesus. You know, and if you're European, you think, well, Americans are fine folks, but they're awfully religious. And, and another idea, you know, and then we kind of look around and we just think, oh my gosh, what a godless bunch of people we all are. But none of those people that say those things, that's not our enemy. Paul says, look, it's not enemies of blood and flesh. And, you know, keep in mind, they're dealing with Roman persecution at this point. Rome had taken out Jesus. But Rome didn't have the power of resurrection. So they didn't see that happening. They thought they could just end all, all that Jesus business by being a blood and flesh enemy to him and take out his flesh and spill his blood. But resurrection was something greater. It's Paul saying, look, against the rulers and the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That's that invisible word, world that we talk about in the creed. Of all, in the Nicene Creed, all that is visible and invisible. There are things at work that you cannot and will never not see that are trying to do in not just the Christian faith, but you as a Christian. And it's going to be a hard, hard fight. But Paul reminds the Ephesians, they're in, they've been given great gifts. And I'm here this morning to tell you, you have these same gifts. And he goes into this wonderful Extended metaphor. Right? And each one of these things, when you think about them as a piece of armor, has something to do in the spiritual wars you will fight. Now, you might consider a belt is not much of a piece of armor, but it would have been in those days. It would have been part of your fighting apparatus. You would have to gird up your loins. You're wearing a kind of brief toga type or tunic. And your belt would have been around your waist with the express pur purpose of you pulling up from the backside your tunic and tucking it into your belt. That way your legs are free to move. And it gets you in fighting position. And so which belt does Paul say? He says the belt of Truth. Knowing the truth. Knowing the truth is what makes you ready to get into a spiritual fight. If you know, if you walk into a spiritual warfare situation and you're kind of wishy washy that Jesus is Lord, if that's a truth that you're kind of. Yeah, maybe, I guess. You're in for big trouble. These are the types of truths Paul is talking about. So be ready, be wearing the truth. Know what the truth is. Know who Christ is. Know what Christ has done for you and for all of us. 
And then Paul says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. A breastplate would pr protect your most vulnerable organs. That's why you'd want to wear one. In the spiritual world, what protects you? What protects you in those most vital places, not literally your organs at this point now, but it serves that same function. It protects your most vital parts of your spiritual body, and that is righteousness. Being the sort of person that does the right thing at least more often than not. Put shoes on your feet. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of God peace. In other words, in your spiritual warfares, you're going to be moving down the road. Keep moving because you've got a job to do. That's your mission. It's your mission to proclaim the gospel of peace. And what's, that's not just peace of, of not war. He says we're in a war. It's the peace that we have peace with God. Through Christ Jesus. It, it just boggles my mind the number of people that want to talk about the faith as if it is uh, God's out to get you. Don't be doing that. Don't be doing those drugs and drinking and dancing. God's just looking for excuses for you to burn. If you wake up tomorrow dead, where are you going to wake up, heaven or hell? <laughs> That's not the gospel. The gospel is that because of Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. And so you better have on some shoes so you can get out there and tell that to the world. So now you've got you've tried to live a righteous life. You know what the truths are. You're ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. And guess what? Your spiritual battling's not over. Because the enemy, the flaming arrows of the evil one, will be taking pot shots at you every moment he possibly can. And here's the great thing about the shield, right? Are you supposed to tuck tail and run? No, a shield says you're going to have to be facing them. Those pot shots that come your way. Look at who is throwing them. Who in a spiritual sense. These rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers. Not visible things know where the arrows are coming from and face them down. Finally, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Helmet protects your head, of course. But it's also where you keep your knowledge. Nobody still, in many ways, we don't know how the brain works, but even in those days, everyone knew that a good knock on the head was going to hurt you and take away your knowledge, make it impossible for you to think well. But what provides that protection for you? And it's your salvation. Because your salvation is granted in a promise of God through Jesus Christ, and you can take all the shots on the head that you want, but you are saved. Now, I know we have lots of folks that have differences about when are you saved, is it you saved when you make your commitment to Christ or anything like that. For Lutherans, salvation always happens right there. That's the day you were saved. Because God made a promise that you would be his beloved child. And we know, we know from stories like the prodigal son, you can be a well-behaved son or you can be a poorly behaved son. 
You can be a poorly behaved son who reprints, and you can be a well behaved son who suddenly is filled with resentment and but it doesn't matter. They're still sons of the Father and his promises to them. And so, like with you, you will go through seasons in your life where you are spiritually weak and submit and succumb to all sorts of temptations. But, just like the prodigal son, you can return home. And then, as you're doing this, as you're doing this, you're not alone. You're not alone in this, these spiritual battles against the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers of this present darkness. Spiritual forces of evil. You're not alone because you have the ability to pray and with the power because you have the spirit. And so staying in contact with God through the Holy Spirit through par- prayer. But always be on look. Paul says, keep alert, persevere in supplication for all the saints. All right, so pray for everyone. I know, I know, I know, you know, it's a hard thing when we raise a child in the faith, and then they don't seem to be as faithful as we would have thought they were. And we all have people. And what's Paul saying here? He says, you pray for them. Pray for those people. It's the same story as when Jesus is there in the house and they lower the guy down on the mat by breaking open the the ceiling, the roof of the house, and they lower this invalid down. And Jesus says to them, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll heal this guy because of your faith. Not because of the, this guy's the invalid. He didn't have the faith to get there. It's his friends who brought him there. And so likewise, then, and Jesus does a good thing for the, he heals the man who's an invalid. Likewise, with our prayers, we can bring God's blessings to those who aren't even asking for them. He'll do it on account of the fact that we ask. And so you have people in your life that you know and you love and they might have been faithful or they might have been raised in the faith or something like that. And now something's changed for them. Pray for them. They're dealing with a spiritual war. And if they're failing, they need your prayers. Paul finally says, pray for me, because I'm that ambassador guy. I ask the same of you, please pray for me. I'll have you know I was not going this direction with this sermon at all until about four minutes before Melba started reading it. And I don't know what that's all about. Certainly seems like it's a better sermon than the one I had prepared. Truth. Sometimes you sometimes you just gotta fly by the seat of the spirit. But it seemed like, you know, in we're in a tough spot. The whole church is. The whole church in America, the whole church in there are explaining to the fellow that worked in the truck, I said, look, there are Seven Lutheran churches in our zip code alone. With an aging population, all nobody's having the amount of kids they used to have. The church is getting smaller, and not all of those seven are going to make it one day. And so it kind of gets nerve-wracking. Us? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, there's a battle going on, but we know how the war ends. We know how the war ends. So put on your armor of God and get out there. You know, I, I was going to do uh, the order of blessing for our, the gifts that we received. 
a little bit later on in the service, but I'm going to do it right now. I ask you to stand. You know, it's a big, it's, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal that this congregation has been able to maintain itself financially over the past 16 months. That's no small thing. Not all churches are being able to do that. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stink. I imagine we will probably pass spending, what, $15,000 thereabouts on air conditioning for a room that we're not even using that much anymore, or for now. But we've got the faith that we will again. We've got the faith that there's going to be a need to gather in fellowship as Christian brothers and sisters. There's going to be a need to uh, have um, community meetings there. So we're getting ready for it. We're taking kind of a leap of faith in this. That this place is put here by God to serve this community in many different ways. And yesterday was just the first indicator to me that, yeah, God still has a purpose for this place and for you people. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 26, When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle it in, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. This is, this is the first fruits principle. And why does God want the first fruits? He didn't ask for the best fruits. He asked for the first ones. Because the first fruits are the ones that require faith. If your first 10% of your crops come in, you've gathered them up and you offer them up as a burnt sacrifice, and then the locusts hit, then the, then the drought comes, you're in big trouble. So it's an act of faith because you've set nothing aside for seed for next year. And you've said you don't know how you're going to eat the following year. So it's an act of faith to give those first fruits to God. And so that's what our offerings are. We are first fruits. We gathered from this community food for people who need it. So we'd like God to bless that. The Lord be with you. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe. You've made the whole earth for your glory. All creation praises you. We lift our voices to join the songs of heaven and earth, of things seen and unseen. You stretch out your hands like, stretch out the heavens like a tent. You divided the day from the night. You appointed times and seasons for work and rest, for tearing down and building up. You blessed your people through all generations and guided them in faith, in life, and love. Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam, Isaiah and all the prophets, Mary, the mother of our Lord, Peter, James, John, all the twelve, and all the saints and witnesses in your church of ages past, in whom your spirit spoke and moved. We give you thanks, O God, that we set apart these gifts of food and cash to your glory and praise. Grant us faith to know your gracious purpose in all things. Give us joy in them and lead us to the building up of your kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Bless you of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on these gifts and be also on you. Amen. All right, our next hymn. Is hymn 810, if you're looking down the book. Uh, oh, Jesus, I have promised, verses 1 and 4. 
We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. I mean, Neil is able. Blessed leader of your church. God of creation. Bless fields and orchards. Protect the land from drought and bring life giving rain to support growth. Instruct your people in the wise treatment of the world you have provided for all your creatures. Lord, in your mercy. God of community. Bless all who seek justice between nations and peoples. Give guidance to bridge builders, heal divisions, and inspire cooperation in times of crisis, disaster, and war. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would watch over our troops stationed overseas, particularly, and here at home. Lord, in your mercy, God of compassion, bless all who are in need. Accompany all who are lonely and feeling abandoned and remind them of your abiding presence. Accompany all who are persecuted and exploited and open us to their cries, especially those on our prayer list and those we now name aloud and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, God of change, bless our transitions. Guide all who are embarking on new stages in life, such as a new job, a new school, a new community. Sustain enduring friendships and kindle new relationships and interest. Lord, in your mercy, God of comfort, bless all who mourn the deaths of their loved ones. We give you thanks for the saints who have gone before us. Renew our confidence in your promise of resurrection and life in the world to come. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share God's peace from a socially responsible distance. The Lord be he with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God invites you to this table of bounty. Come, the banquet is ready. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you.
same to you. All right. Now the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Let us pray together. Oh God, in this holy communion, you have welcomed us into your presence, nourished us with words of mercy, and fed us at your table. Strengthen us to love you with all our heart. Serve our neighbors with a willing spirit, and honor the earth you have made. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Now, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and, our, and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. All right, our final hymn is hymn 805. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 of Lead On, O King Eternal. serve the Lord.